Hello, and welcome to this special episode of The Cube from RSA, where we are going to unpack the latest Fortinet FortiGuard Labs Global Threat Landscape Report and how cyber criminals are moving exponentially faster on exploits nowadays. Joining me to help unpack this is Derek Mankey, Chief Security Strategist and Global VP Threat Intelligence at FortiGuard Labs. Welcome on board, Derek. Great to be on board and uh, back talking to the cube again. Yeah, I mean you're an old pro at this, so it's it's good. I, I think again, you know, year over year, uh, cyber criminals really don't rest. So this is this is really interesting stuff where we get to talk to you. And I, I think again, having you back and talking about the latest threat landscape is always exciting, especially given you know the week that we're having here at RSA. You know, what are some of the key takeaways from the second half of 2000? 23s or to get or to guard labs research on the threat landscape report the global threat landscape report what were some of the takeaways yeah so i'll i'll uh, 40 000 foot view takeaways um so these attacks they're they're so no rest for the wicked like you said these attacks they're moving quicker uh so there's an accelerated attack chain that we're seeing we're also seeing um a shift of uh Playbooks, expansion of playbooks. So that means there's more strategy that the you know cyber criminals are employing when it comes to attacks. Uh, we are seeing um, uh, more of a targeted nature. So we're actually seeing drops in volume of attacks, but that's not a good thing. We're seeing again cyber criminals shift into a more targeted nature when it comes to uh, industries uh, they're looking at and so forth. So uh, faster, more sophistication, work smarter, not harder. Um, we talked about cyber criminals not having rest. Well, they are employing tools like offensive automation and early beginnings of weaponized machine learning and artificial intelligence. Yeah, no, we've been hearing that from the organizations we talked to as well. And I, I think it really ties together. And with the report really highlighting the increased speed that cyber criminals are targeting newly released CVEs, how are organizations supposed to keep up and prioritize this activity to reduce risk? Yeah, so I, I, I can't I, I can't emphasize this en enough how much the, the risk exposure has increased here, right? If we look at the 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 facts from the report, we are seeing that attack this was actually surprising to me. Uh in a six month period, so you know, second half uh, compared to the first half of twenty twenty three, uh we saw that attack chain, meaning when a new C V E was published from you know, once the clock starts ticking. Uh, it was less than five days on average for all CVEs that we saw before uh, attackers start to capitalize on that, try to exploit it, put it into, you know, weaponize it essentially, right? Um, that was three and a half days faster than the first half of 2023. So we're talking about that window shrinking from, you know, about eight days to under five days now, meaning obviously if, from a blue team's perspective, we need to uh, prioritize a response to this. So that's that's the fact of the matter. That's what happening. Uh, that's what's happening when it comes to the organizations and prioritizing. Um, you know, that's the bad news I just talked about. The good news is um, we're not talking about twenty thousand CVEs here. I mean, there was north of twenty eight thousand published last year. <clears throat> um, we're talking about something that's much more manageable. We have a, a red zone as an example in the report where we're actually talking about less than one percent. If we look at Total CVEs published, it's over 200,000 of them. It's less than only 1% of those that are actively being attached. Attack. So it's really important uh, to use these as tools. We have it published in the report to actually guide into a much more bite-sized, manageable uh, approach for strategic patch management. I was going to say that that makes a lot of sense where, again, that a lot of the CVEs have been out there for a long time as well and you know have been targeted over the years. And sometimes... They've been there, you know, for more than a decade. How 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 are you looking at these organizations? Is that the approach they should be taking? Is looking for the sweet spot in that red zone? Absolutely, because these are the ones that are often used in outbreaks, so new breaking attacks on fresh, you know, fresh vulnerabilities, end days, right? Uh, so we're not we're not even talking about zero days. We're talking about end days because pat they're, they're published CVEs patches are available. Um, so it's very manageable, right? Um, 
especially when you start using tools and technologies, not not just people, right, to do vulnerability compliance management and and being able to plug into those latest outbreaks. We have outbreak alerts at Fortinet that actually streamlines and automates all of that. So there's tools, there's processes. Um, it takes the human out of the equation more, and and just by plugging those, like the hot button issues, essentially. That vastly reduces uh, your attack surface exposure and, and and the risk, right? So that that it is a viable viable approach, but it's it's interesting because the other end of the spectrum, you know. So we're talking about the fresh breaking. The other thing in the report we saw was that, and unfortunately, we talk about this all the time, but it's reality. Ninety eight percent, virtually all organizations that we saw in twenty twenty three and in the second half are still under attack from CVEs that are at least five years old. Um, so those are things that, you know, patches have been available for a very, very long time. Um, but still we have this conversation about, um, these, the shelf life of, of these CVEs essentially. Right. Yeah. I think that that's like you said, an organizational approach that people need to take about, Hey, you know, they're not going after, you know, zero days all the time. And, and things of that nature. They're looking backwards to a certain extent because there's known known tools there, known kits, and things of that nature. Plus, you know, with AI getting getting a little bit involved, uh, you know, in ML, as you said, it's it's uh, starting to be weaponized. But let's let's kind of like double click into the rest ransomware trend because it always seems that one of the most prominent topics at any conference. Uh, such as RSA, is that we see the headlines are all about, you know, ransomware and how many people are being impacted and the cost of ransomware. Can you kind of explain a little bit more about that and what what you're seeing and double clicking into that? Yeah. So it's like I said, this is a work smarter, not harder approach across the boards. Um, you know that 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 rings true on on the zero days like we talked about the reality is it's not the zero days it's the end days that right because they work unfortunately still so why raise the bar when you don't have to from a cyber criminals perspective you know to be able to weaponize zero days that's a cost on cyber criminals right if they don't have to jump through those hoops they won't and that's why we're seeing everything we just talked about on the cve front on the ransomware front it's very much the same thing um you know the ransomware game has been evolving uh for well over a decade. Um, I remember speaking at security conferences on ransomware prior to 2010 when it first came out, really. And, um, you know, back then, of course, the playbook was very isolated. It was just about data encryption. Now we're, we've seen that playbook expand into at least four or five different levels from extortion to, uh, you know, moving away from just data encryption to extortion of data to, you know, double extortion on customer data to triple extortion threats now on destructive elements of this, it keeps on expanding, right? And what they've done now is their operational playbooks that has expanded. We actually saw a 70% drop in volume in ransomware. So that you would think that's a congratulations, shake the hand, good news scenario. Um, but in fact, what we're seeing is they're just shifting the goalposts and they're now starting to be much more calculated, doing reconnaissance, weaponizing machine learning to do social engineering on these targets. Operational technology is the number one sector that we're seeing. Almost half of all global ransomware, 44%, targeting OT, uh, specifically manufacturing. It's because they've shifted away from the data now, and they're looking at services and revenue-producing services and or you know production lines in manufacturing. And they, they know if they can take out manu a manufacturing plant for a day, for an example, it's going to translate into X amount of dollars in lost revenue, and they have that in their Guide, guidebook in their playbook. Yeah, I think that the the groups are be becoming uh, more corporate in that way, and they're they're definitely looking at how much revenue can they disrupt, and you know they have their own KPIs uh, to that extent. But can you yep. like explain a little bit more uh, some of the insights that Fortigard Labs is seeing with those APT threat actors, and as it's progressed through twenty twenty three. Yeah, so the Lions, the ABT arena is very interesting. He's used to be quite separated. I think we've maybe talked about this before, but it's becoming more and more apparent now where uh, cybercrime and APT are converging as well. We see shared infrastructure between the between the two groups. Cyber criminals are acting like APT actors now. You know, there's over 140 tracked APT groups. 
we have seen an increase um you know at every half that we that we release this report on apt activity uh we saw 38 of these active over a third um of all apt groups actually waking up think remember an apt group usually takes it's about a two-year cycle right to go through that weaponization phase launch and attack we're seeing a lot of these more and more active um and it's also because of that shared infrastructure and working with cyber criminals so it's it's quite interesting um you know uh to see that happening now um e even to the point of activity on dark web forums too yeah I, I think that to me is one of the things that uh you know would keep me up as, at night to put it mildly is the fact that you have these different approaches that these organizations are taking and they're looking at it as hey this is this is more of a corporate they're you know even some of them we've heard have uh hr departments and things of that nature to, to, to business units yep yeah, and I, I think that to me is is really one of the the craziest things is that you start to you know we're as they more weaponize everything and more take a uh, strategic approach, uh, you know, getting this data that you guys are providing back and having that early threat detection and un understanding things before they happen becomes even more you know more important from that perspective. Um, is is that what you're seeing from the organizations and why they're reaching out is that hey you know we can't do this alone yeah absolutely so i mean it there's always a mirror image here right on the on the red team the threat actor side they're reaching out for help uh we've seen almost every model now under crime services so crime as a service they're monetizing that we're seeing ransom as a, a service as an example where they have hundreds of these outsourced affiliates that actually deploy the, the ransomware and get a commission um on the blue team side in our industry it's the same thing we reach out for help public and private partnerships how we can work together to share threat intelligence to actually create a, an ecosystem of disruption to impose a higher cost on the attacker and we talk about that all the time but we're actually doing that right there's a lot of great efforts underway and we highlight some of these in the report like cyber threat alliance which is now over a decade um old i uh, sharing the private sector but also disruption on with law enforcement and interpol and working with the world economic forum and cybercrime atlas where we're actually mapping the ecosystem of cybercrime um identifying how many different points we can hit that hurts so it's very strategic to actually go and disrupt as well too. yeah i i think the, again you guys touch on this in that announcement around the radical transparency and you know how we have to build an ecosystem and build it stronger together and are you seeing the other organizations both government and private and businesses coming together more and more about this yes absolutely and it's a maturity uh phase in the industry i would say um we've been through this before in other aspects in the past threat intelligence sharing is one of those right that's been going on for a long time this new protocols, frameworks, technology, everyone is receptive to it. Um, there's more and more of that happening. Um, and, and there's more options coming out of that on the responsible disclosure, responsible, transparent. So responsible disclosure actually has been also a decade. Um, that's very specific to how you handle vulnerabilities and release it. Um, and so that's been in motion for a while. And we've seen some of the industry growing up with that responsible transparency is the new aspect of that. And so it's happening still takes some time right this is um really on the table right now and organizations are coming together to embrace and then adopt it it's exciting right because we've seen this before and we've shown that it can work and with the transparency angle um you know that's that, that's going to be a game changer i think in the industry right um because at the end of the day being transparent helps to build more resilient networks and imposes it's it achieves our end goal of imposing a higher cost on you know the adversary and um making cybersecurity a more safe place yeah no i i think that's the key is that everybody is looking to, at how do they be part of the solution not part of the problem and how that transparency really helps with that as well right and 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 sorry I'll, I'll just say that we're always talking about the problem too much i would say and we do have to right but the point is again with transparency we're talking about the solutions also i think that's a really important piece yeah yeah and i i think again it's it it's one of these things that i i even the organizations that we talk to on a regular basis and you talk to them and they're like we can't do this alone the problem is so big 
and we have to get our hands around it. And we just don't have eyes on everything, especially as you get out of the uber large organizations into kind of that uh, fat middle of organizations that really, you know, sometimes uh, the security people are actually wearing multiple hats uh, in there. Uh, what else didn't we cover that you think was interesting in the report? I would say, um, again, let's talk about the solutions here, right? So there's a lot of bad always. That's that's not going to go away. The bad can get better from all the efforts that we're doing on disruption and so forth. Um, but you know, my my the takeaway from the report here is that look, there's a lot going on. Cybersecurity is always daunting, but there are certain steps you can take to again focus on, prioritize that really reduce that risk. Uh, and the attack surface. So again, things like the red zone that we talk about in the report, um, shoring up the the end day problem on 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 the aging vulnerabilities uh, that we talked about, uh, utilizing um, technology too to take the human out of that mundane cycle loop because these attacks are going quick, right? We're talking about less than five days now for these new CVEs when they break. The best way to approach that is to elevate the human out of the the stitching of the fabric, right? And to have uh, automation, like by a SOAR as an example, to have machine learning and artificial intelligence and, and, and fabric threat intelligence, all of that to be able to respond. Because you can absolutely do that to respond to these new threats, not even within days, but within hours and minutes sometimes. So that's the good news, right? Everything exists today. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. Um, and yeah, and, and, and there's some good takeaways from that in the report. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree. I mean, the cognitive load is, uh, is quite extreme on the people who have to sit there and manage through all of these threats and all of the alerts and all of that, the semen sore and using the technology even better is always a good thing. So I, I want to thank you for coming on board, Derek, uh, and sharing all this valuable information uh, from the research because it, it, it is so important to get that out there and share that with others so that they understand where, where are the, where's the goal line today and where's the goal line going so that they can uh, do better planning and be more strategic. So thank you for coming on board. Absolutely. It's a pleasure. Please uh, stay safe, everyone. Absolutely. You've got to stay safe. So, and thank you for watching as we unpack Fortigard's Global Threat Landscape Report on The Cube, the leader in high-tech enterprise analysis and coverage.